Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Hello and welcome to A Moment with American political historian and author Alan Lichtman. We're talking about the division in the nation, whether politics have divided the country irrevocably. What has caused the intense division, the incivility of the debate, or is this just political business as usual? Welcome to the program, Alan. Thank you. My pleasure. Very to happy to have you here. And before we talk, some background on Alan Lichtman. Hillary Clinton starts out as the front runner. When it comes to American politics, or more specifically, presidential elections, Professor Alan Lichtman has plenty of opinions. This day, he was sharing his views about the 2008 presidential election with members of the foreign press. Everyone else is going to have to chase her campaign to get the nomination. For more than 30 years, Lichtman has taught history at American University in Washington, D.C. He initially went to college to become a medical doctor, even completing the pre-med program at Brandeis University before completely changing direction. No one could imagine anyone giving up a spot in medical school to go to history graduate school. But I decided I wanted to study history because the study of history encompasses everything. Graduating in 1973 with a PhD in American politics from Harvard University, Lickman has put his diverse educational background to good use as a historian. Drawing on my science background, the mathematical analysis of trends and patterns in history, using math to study things like uh, how different groups voted. I firmly believe, as someone who's studied and taught and written about history, I want to share my insights with a broad public and bring to bear the insights of history and the lessons of history and the perspective of history on current events. What fascinates Lickman most about political history today is how we are bound to repeat it. Take for instance the war in Iraq. What fascinates me most is how we've totally ignored history today. You know, I studied the Vietnam War. I lived through the Vietnam years. As a student of history, and as someone who's lived through the 60s, I never believed we could make exactly the same mistakes. And yet is that is precisely what we're doing in Iraq. It was as though Vietnam had never occurred. Outside the classroom, Lickman has testified as an expert witness in more than 70 voting and civil rights cases. He has written dozens of articles and published six books, including this popular one, The 13 Keys to the Presidency. And the 13 keys are 13 yes and no questions that gauge the political strength and performance of the party in power and give you a decision rule as to whether the party in power will get elected again or not. The 13 keys ask questions about issues like economic growth, foreign policy, and social unrest. And it's real simple. If the party in power loses six or more of the key indicators, they're out. The 13 Keys have correctly predicted every presidential election since 1984. It recently received attention from the international forecasting community. Believing he could impact government more directly, beyond just historical analysis, a few years ago, Lickman decided to take a bold step. I sought to obtain the United States Senate because I believed the United States Senate needed someone with a knowledge and understanding of history. He ran as a candidate from Maryland, addressing issues from the war in Iraq to global warming. I never got attention from the press. I never got any endorsements from major party leaders. Uh, the big money donors avoided me. And uh, I wound up with only a little over 1% of the vote. During the race, Lickman received some unexpected attention from law enforcement 
after he protested being shut out of a televised debate between the senatorial candidates on public television. And I was arrested, kind of a universal fate of protesters. And believe it or not, this is what I was charged with, I'm not making this up, trespassing on public property after hours. I thought that was such an absurd charge. The charge was eventually dropped, but three others were added. They included trespassing on public property during hours, disobeying a police officer, and disturbing the peace. I went to court, I had a trial, and was acquitted and exonerated on all counts without even having to present any evidence, simply presenting our constitutional arguments that I was exercising free speech, and the judge said not guilty on all counts, and was quite disturbed, in fact, that this case was ever brought. It should never have been brought, and we should have been allowed to debate. The run for office gave the political historian new perspective. Our politics is so money-driven, it's so insider-driven, that it's very difficult for someone who doesn't have a typical profile to become an office holder. Although he hasn't ruled out a future run for office, he currently has no plans. Lickman is focusing his attention back on his political blog, POTUS, where he just finished writing about his U.S. Senate race. He also has plans to release a new book just before the 2008 presidential election on the history of American conservative politics. His thesis is that there are two inseparable core values to conservatism, and you can't take them apart. One is conserving private enterprise. The other is conserving white Protestant cultural values. When asked what he thought about the future of politics... There's the ballot box, there's the soapbox, and there's the streets. And if ordinary people use all three, there is hope for our politics. Kim Skeen reporting for A Moment With. Welcome again. Thanks Thank for you. being here. Um, does it just seem that we are living in more bitical, bitter political times, or are we really? We really and truly are. Flashback to 1972. George McGovern from the left running against Richard Nixon from the right. Well, if you look at the makeup of the House and the Senate in those days, there are lots of Democrats who are more conservative than lots of Republicans, and lots of Republicans who are more liberal than lots of Democrats. In other words, our politics was mixed. Flash forward after the election of 2000, and the scissors have almost completely opened up. Mm -hmm. Today, there is scarcely a Democrat more conservative than any Republican, and scarcely a Republican more liberal than any Democrat. So the whole politics has become far more polarized because we've lost the moderate Southern Democrats and we've lost the Rockefeller Republicans, and both sides have polarized. But why? Why have we lost all that? Because of the evolution of modern conservatism, really in the late 70s, and onward. Conservatism consolidated in two ways in the late 70s. Number one, with the rise of the religious right. Mm -hmm. Religious right's always been with us, but it became much more visible, much more political, and much more fundamentally part of the base of the Republican Party. And then secondly, a much tighter union between business and the Republican Party. It used to be business gave pretty much support fairly equally to both parties in the late 20th century that fundamentally changes. The rise of the, um, the conservative religious fundamentalist movement, it didn't seem to be so powerful during the Reagan years. What, uh, can you track when, when the rise came and all the factors that played into that? There are two waves. One is the very late 1970s, when you get the formation of groups like Jerry Falwell's The Moral Majority or the Religious Roundtable. Mm -hmm. Now, this gets diffused during the Reagan years because Reagan gave the religious right a lot of lip service, but not a lot of concrete policy advances. Then they kind of decline, you're right, during the Reagan years, and then the real impetus comes at the beginning of the 1990s with two things. Number one, the formation of the Christian coalition, which gives religious fundamentalism 
a grassroots base and a political mobilization, and then it takes over much of the Republican Party at the local level, and then secondly, the Gingrich Revolution of 1994, which gives Republicans unified control of both houses of Congress for the first time in 40 years. What, what role, Professor Lichtman, if any, I think it did, uh, did talk radio play? The rise of talk radio. Talk radio is extremely important because it's another mechanism for reaching the grassroots. One of the reasons the right has had trouble over time in mobilizing the grassroots was the Democrats had the labor movement. The right didn't have anything comparable. By the late 80s, you got talk radio led by Rush Limbaugh, but of course many other figures, including Colonel Sean, Oliver North. You Sean know, Hannity. And Sean Hannity. G. Gordon so Liddy. Many, and so then many. regionally, Mike That's Gallagher right. in New York, you all drive, over the place. You, you, would drive, you probably have done this. Drive across America yes. in the 1990s. You heard two things. Country music and right-wing mm -hmm. talk radio. Mm -hmm. Rush Limbaugh was invited to talk to the new Republican majority after 1994, and they credited him, at least in part, with helping the Republicans win back the House and Senate. Okay, so how then did we square President Bush's, George W.'s promise to be a healer, not a divider, with the times that seemed to be more divisive than ever with his coming? A couple of things. Number one, the parties had already polarized. The Democrats had pretty much lost their moderate Southerners. Republicans had lost uh, many of the liberal Northeastern Rockefeller Republicans. And the base of the Republican Party had become Christian conservatives. Even more than high-income voters, if you wanted to find a Republican voter, you would look for a white male Protestant preferably from the South, but anywhere. If you wanted to find a Democratic voter, you'd look for an African American or a Jewish American with the Catholics in between. So Bush had to play to his base, and that's what his advisors told him to, to do. Then everything changes with 9-11. The Bush administration was floundering a bit before 9-11. It got its tax cuts. Mm -hmm. It's got it, uh, no child left behind. What was to be its next act? It didn't know. But after 9-11, George Bush found his historic mission to fight evil all over the world and to protect America from terrorism. Where, where, how will history judge the Bush presidency? Well, we don't know because it, it's not complete, but I think it, it'll judge it fairly harshly, but judge it as a very important presidency. Depending on what happens, one might say George Bush has killed the conservative movement in the United States. Ironically, it was looked at, George Bush was originally looked at as the triumph mm -hmm. of conservatism. But two things went wrong. Number one, this overweening, aggressive foreign policy, particularly this new doctrine of preemptive war, which really had not been part of American doctrine in the same way before this, and secondly, this attempt to use military force to reshape nations of the world. The other thing that happened... Which he said he didn't want to do. He said, you know, we should walk humbly mm -hmm. around the world in the campaign of 2000. It was Al Gore and Bill Clinton who were the nation builders. Mm -hmm. That all changed after 9-11. But number two, and equally important, was this very close alliance between business and conservative Republicans, which led to a form of conservative big government. Instead of cutting back on big government, George Bush has been one of the biggest spenders in American history, a lot of it in this so-called corporate welfare or responsive to the needs of business. We have a new kind of big government today, conservative big government, that I think has cost conservatives a lot of their moral authority. And a lot of thoughtful conservatives uh, believe that themselves. Francis Fukuyama, for example, the famous neoconservative uh, intellectual, has written a book very critical of the Bush administration. Paul Craig Roberts, who was a major figure in the Reagan administration as an economic advisor, has written a lot of polemics saying George Bush has undermined and destroyed conservatism in America. 
you uh, in the piece compare Iraq to um, Vietnam, yes. um, kind of what Santayana, we didn't learn, those who don't learn the lessons repeat them. Are they the same lessons? Is very it, similar it, lessons. Ab, very similar, with, and they are. Let me give you just a few, there are so many. Number one, a war begun on a deceptive basis will not succeed. The Vietnam War was started on a deceptive basis. But not by us. Yes, by, but Johnson made his big escalation. But the French were fighting it first. You can trace the Vietnam War right back to the end of World War II. But I'm okay. talking about the big American military intervention, mm -hmm. which built up to 550,000 troops at its peak in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. That was the big change. And that was based on a deception. Johnson knew we couldn't militarily win in Vietnam. He knew at best we could force the North Vietnamese to negotiate. But are you going to go tell the American people, let's go out there and put our soldiers in harm's way to tie one for the Gipper? <laughs> so deception. deception. What else? And the, of course, the uh, Iraq war was based on this deception as well, that there was this immediate threat from weapons of mass destruction to the security of the United States. Second big thing that you can deal with what is fundamentally political, cultural issues militarily. That we can militarily go into a situation and simply by the use of force solve it. That was the big mistake in Vietnam. We're trying to prop up militarily a government that couldn't be propped up and we're trying to reshape a whole culture and a whole system in Iraq militarily making the same mistake. And, and <laughs> Many people believe that, that Vietnam was the war America lost. Um, President Bush's supporters say, don't cut and run, but how can you win? You can't win. There is no military solution in Iraq. Who are you going to kill? Who is the enemy? The enemy is anyone and everyone. And the more we're killing Muslims in Iraq, the more and more Iraq becomes a magnet for recruiting al-Qaeda and recruiting terrorists all over the Muslim world. We are creating our own worst enemies by staying in Iraq. We're devastating that country. Anyone who can leave is leaving. So the intelligentsia, uh, those who are most able to build the country, are fleeing the country. We're destroying the country. We're undermining our own security. As in Vietnam, we're putting Americans and Iraqis, in the case, of course, it was Vietnamese, in harm's way to no end. Do you know, you know how many Asians were killed during the Vietnam War? A great many. Two to three million yeah. Asians were killed, along with 58,000 some odd Americans killed on an impossible, deceptive mission. We're now still embarked on an impossible, deceptive mission. And the only question is, at what point are we going to face up to the fact that we have to leave? Richard Nixon, another uh, parallel, said to Henry Kissinger, I know that the South Vietnamese government can't stand on its own, but I want to create a decent interval so it doesn't look like we're cutting and running. And how many died so that Richard Nixon politically could have his decent interval? How many are going to die today so George Bush and others can have their decent interval? And by the way, the Democrats are very much to blame here as well. I don't exonerate them at all. Um, one, one more quick thing, and then I want to move on to talk about some other things. Do you think that many Americans are um, confounded by the argument that to criticize the war is not to support the troops? Those are two very separate things, and yet they have been made one by the people who support the president and the war effort. Throughout the history of war, those who send young men and women to die wrap their policies in the mantle of those noble folks who are making the sacrifice. It's one of the worst sides of the war. The policies that we follow in Iraq have nothing to do with supporting and protecting the troops. In fact, if you look at what's going on with our veterans, this administration hardly supports and protects the troops. The best way to support and protect the troops is to bring them home. Um, let's talk about the Democrats and the Republicans and the people who are emerging as sure. um, would-be nominees. In the piece, you said Hillary Clinton, in essence, is the person to beat. Yes. We hear over and over a woman, although the women have run for president before, we hear an African-American, although African-Americans have run before. 
What is there all that about these two people? Well, I think it's fabulous that, you know, the front runner is now a woman. It's long past time. You know, women's suffrage was 1920. So that's, there's that. It there's was, that. she's the front runner. That's right. And the reason she's the front runner is she is incredibly well known, has name recognition equal to that of the President of the United States, has proven to be a very effective senator from New York, and has built an incredible political and fundraising machine. And by the way, pretty close to 90% of Americans say they're ready to elect a woman. More Americans say, I'd be cautious about voting for a Mormon than I would be about voting for a woman, which exactly. is really, and I or even a black, even that. an African American. More Americans say, I'm cautious about voting for a Mormon than an African American. And Barack Obama is a real force. He's not the front runner, but uh, he could take this nomination. He's, you think so? No, I, not really. I mean, I think it's a real long shot. I think he's really not quite ready. It's only been a couple of years in Washington. Peaking too soon. Maybe peaking a little too soon, but by God, he is the one figure on either side who's captured our imaginations. There's no Republican who's captured our imaginations. There's no other Democrat who excites us the same way as Barack Obama. What is Hillary Clinton's high negative? What is the thing that makes people dislike her, do you think? Some well, people, many people. By the way, her negatives aren't as high as one might think. They've, they've kind of eased. And, you know, most of the people who are polarized against Hillary Clinton probably wouldn't vote for a Democrat. Anyway, it, it goes back to right. the, the, the hatred of the Clintons all the way back to, uh, you know, these are draft dodging, pot smoking, <laughs> self-indulgent ex-hippies, and, you know, and that was to some people, uh, verified over the course of the administration. That's really the animus here. It's cultural. Of the Republicans, you've already mentioned Mitt Romney. Why yeah. is his Mormonism such a hot-button issue? Because, as we've said, particularly in primary elections, a uh, substantial base of the Republican Party is the Christian right. And in fact, if Romney's going to win, he's got to become the candidate of the right because he can't move to the left of Rudy Giuliani. So he's got to move to the right. But a lot of uh, so, devout uh, evangelical right. Christians believe Mormonism is a heresy. Uh, and they don't trust the candidate not... Who represents that heretical uh, type of To govern religion. according to the Constitution and That's not right. according now, to the Now maybe he religion. can overcome that. Mm -hmm. Barriers can always be overcome. But this is the paradox of Mick, Mitt Romney. He's got to have as his base the very people who might be most suspicious of his religion. He certainly can overcome, and he's certainly been trying, you know, on, on, on abortion, on other issues of, on, you know, religion in the public square, other issues very important to the Christian right. He's certainly changed his moderate stance from when he was governor of Massachusetts and really appealed to their ideals. Let's run through um, Giuliani and McCain. The absolute front runners but they both have big problems. Giuliani really is genuinely pro-choice. It's going to be very difficult for the Republicans to nominate a pro-choice candidate and other social issues as well. He's a bit out of step, maybe not with the whole bulk of Republican identifiers, but with Republican primary voters. And he's got some personal issues as well in terms of his personal life. McCain has done everything, you know, but propose marriage to George W. Bush in order to uh, moderate his image and move to the, the center of the Republican Party, but he's still the maverick. You know, he's still a guy that a lot of Republicans in their hearts don't trust. So these guys have great strengths. Giuliani's the hero of, you know, New York's response to 9-11. McCain has this tremendous appeal because people think he's real. You know, he's not on a puppet string. Are we likely to see other candidates emerge? Or do you think there are people who are sitting back waiting for the dust to clear and settle on these... It seems so early, all of it. Let me say two things. One, not on the Democratic side. You've seen the field. This is the field. This is the field. And there may be minor kids, but, you know, it's going to be very hard for anyone right now to compete and, with uh, Obama and, and Hillary Clinton. And how bad is it that it's getting so ugly so soon for the Democrats? When you have this many candidates, it's absolutely to be expected. They're the out party. They're not in power. They can fight. They're, they don't hold the presidency now. On the Republican side, you might see more candidates. Nobody has it locked up. This is the first time in more than 50 years since 1952 
that you've had absolutely wide open races on both the Democratic and Republican side. And why so early? I'll give you the answer in three words. Money, money, money. and money. money. You know, it takes $50 million or more to run a national yeah. presidential yeah. campaign. If you don't start yeah. now, the money sources are going to yeah. be tied up. Are we ever going to figure out a better way? There is a better way, and we all know what it is. Public financing of elections. But the very people who benefit from this corrupt financing system where we have now, where either you've got to be personally wealthy or sold out to every special interest mm -hmm. in America, those who benefit from it are the very ones who'd have to vote in public financing. You're holding a copy of your book, The Keys to the White keys House. Keys to the White House. Have you worked these yet? <laughs> these have worked since I have 1984. Worked these you have They've worked never these missed. keys. Have you worked them yet for the next election? Absolutely. Even though the next election's, you know, a long way away, nearly two years right. away, what the are keys they are beginning to line up. They are. What are they saying? Let me just say, in 2004, the keys clearly showed a Republican victory. And I published memos, I did television commentary telling John Kerry, you're doing all the wrong things. You think you're ahead, you're not. Based on history, you're going to lose. So do something bold. Break the pattern. Fire the hucksters. Make issues your own. Release your cabinet. Do something. Of course, he, he didn't. He ran conventional politics, and now he's a footnote to history. But the winds of historical change are now abroad. And right now, it looks like any Democrat, including an African American, including a woman, including an Hispanic, whoever gets nominated, is going to be elected president. Let me explain why. In 2004, you had an incumbent. Now you have an open seat. One of the keys is whether or not the incumbent party candidate is a sitting president. They lose that key. Mm -hmm. Another key is whether there's going to be an, an internal party fight for the incumbent party, party holding the White House. Clearly, there is going to be a big party fight. Number three. In 2002, the Republicans did real well in the midterm elections. 2006, they did poorly. That's another key factor. That's three keys right there. And they and only remember, need six to lose. Six and you're out. And you've got the foreign policy failure. Mm -hmm. You've got a lack of foreign policy success. That's five keys. So only one more key of all the remaining eight keys have to fall, and that's almost certainly going to happen. And we've got a le little less than one more minute what do you guess that key is going to be? Oh, we, just we, anything. We, we, could, we could have a recession. It's highly uh, unlikely the Republicans are going to nominate a charismatic candidate like Ronald Reagan. That would be uh, the sixth key right there that would fall. Okay. Fascinating. <laughs> I would love to be in one of your classes. Well, thank you. Buddy. <laughs> Let me just make, say one final thing. 30 seconds. I was only going to take that. Sure. You know, Always, looking at the presidential candidates or anybody else, vote for who you believe in. Forget this idea of electability. They're all electable. The Democrats went for Kerry in 2004 because they thought he was electable and he lost. So always vote for who you believe in. That's my major piece of advice to your listeners and viewers out there. <laughs> and I thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And thank you for being with me for this moment with American political historian Alan Lichtman. I'm Lee Thornton. We'll see you next time.